Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And this is the podcast for November 8th, 2020, the 23rd Sunday after Pentecost. And the texts are Amos 5, 18 through 24, uh, or the semi-continuous Old Testament is uh, Joshua 24, selected verses. Psalm 70, the epistle is 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, and the gospels Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Oh, those foolish bridesmaids. <laughs> well, we've got Matthew. Uh, we got a song on this one, Caroline. I do? Uh, trim your lamps, keep them burning bright. Oh, I love that song. I know, right? Yes. It's one of the greatest keep ever. Your lamps trimmed and burning, keep your lamps trimmed. Okay, yep. Anyway, yes, I love that. Oh, that was one of my, um, my mother was a, uh, Coral, she always directed the choir uh, wherever my dad was the pastor until she became a pastor, but that was one of her favorite hymns that she, is it a Natalie Sleeth hymn? I don't know, I'd have to look that up. Pretty sure but, it's a spiritual. Um, oh, but her arrangement, it was like an arrangement. Anyway, it was a, it, one, of, one of her favorites. But uh, we should note that uh, we're going into Matthew 25 and this is it. Like. Um, Matthew 25 is, brings us to the end of, well, not the end of Matthew, but the end of the lectionary year of Matthew. And so first thing the preacher needs to do is, I think, kind of just sort of sit down and read all of 25 and just, uh, you know, because you've got, um, you know, the, this parable, then the parable, the talent, talents and the judgment of the nations. And then, of course, right after this is the, you know, the plot to kill Jesus. So, and the anointing at Bethany. So this whole chapter uh, you, you're going to be looking at this now for the next three weeks. So that's I, just on a practical homiletical perspective to look at, uh, to look at how, you know, how is this um, particular parable setting up this, the, you know, the, the, the themes of this chapter, uh, which, which I think would be helpful. And uh, one thing that, um, that's, that strikes me, and I needed to do more work with the Greek on this, uh, but, but just notice that the kingdom of heaven will be like. Uh, so you have this future tense uh, aspect of the, of, the, of the kingdom, which is different than how it has been. Isn't the, is that right, Matt? Um, is, it a few, is, is it tense or aspect? A little Hebrew joke there, so keep going. Oh, oh, it wasn't good one. funny. Good one. <laughs> it now. Oh, that was so funny, Rolf. It is future, okay. actually. It, it is a future tense. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. And so, huh? What? So I think, you know, that is, um, I think that's something to, to dwell on for a minute, is that especially as we are coming to the end of Jesus' ministry, um, for for these words from Jesus to say uh, the, the kingdom of heaven will be like uh, that that the promise of God's kingdom God's kingdom being established uh, beyond um, beyond uh, the events of the passion even beyond the end of this gospel and so how and and then to kind of you know to kind of reflect back and say how much that has been uh, such a huge issue for Matthew of what this kingdom of heaven looks like. And so the promise of that, of what that kingdom looks like, especially going into, uh, you know, going into uh, the passion narrative in a bit that, that where it looks like that the powers that be are really the ones who, um, who are in control. So that's, that's one thing I was thinking about. I would urge, preachers to read chapter 24 as well as 25. This is Matthew crafts. This is all one speech. And so it's, it, it's connected to the question about the, uh, about the temple and then his talking about the structure of the temple and the future. So it's, everything is future oriented in chapters 24 to, to 25. And especially where the, the tone changes in, in verse 36 about the day and the hour. So it's about this coming day and hour. So everything here is set 
uh, under the theme of this watchfulness and, and urging his disciples uh, to be alert, to be ready, uh, and not to miss uh, what's, what's going to come. And so it's highly dualistic. Everything has uh, a winner and a loser, one taken, one left, you know, one wise, one foolish, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just to kind of say that it, the, I think the future setting here is because he is talking about what's the end of discipleship or what's, what will be the reckoning at which time we finally learn who's authentic and who's false. I mean, to go back to Matthew 13 and the, the parable of the, the wheat and the tares as well. I appreciated the uh, commentary that uh, Dirk Lang gave us where uh, the reference is uh, not making that judgment, but is focusing on the waiting. Um, uh, where he points out that uh, the only one that is doing the judging is God. And I think particularly in this season that we're in right now, where we want to decide who was foolish and who was wise and who's, you know, who's taken and who, who's left behind, is that it's important for us to remember that that's God's work to do and uh, that we are still supposed to be watching and waiting, all of us uh, together. That that was uh, that was a striking um, uh, a perspective for me in reading the commentary that I I think is worth considering in the moment we're living in. It's such a disturbing parable. Yes. <laughs> Nevertheless, we kind of we keep dancing around the context of it, which we have to do. But uh, it's such a disturbing parable because these are. Um, it's not a hero versus villain parable. It's people who appear to be exactly yeah. the same in every respect. They've all been invited. They're all hanging out together. The only difference is when it becomes exposed that one group hasn't um, adequately prepared for something. And, mm -hmm. and there's apparently no going back from that. There's no, no way of sharing the oil or extending it. So everybody always wants the bridegroom to be compassionate and say, here, have some of my oil or here, I'll die for the sake of more oil. You know, but it's, it's not that it's not a cross parable. This is a, this, it's a, uh, it's a judgment parable. It's an end of the ages parable. And this is a Jesus who has talked repeatedly in this gospel about bearing fruit. Uh, who's talked about the dangers of false forms of religion, and false teaching. I mean, so we have to, I think I've mentioned this before with other parables, we have to get a sense of what's, What's he worried about? What's the negative thing that he's trying to warn people against? And it's not, you made a bad mistake. That's why I, I wish you didn't say wise and foolish. It just, but it's, it's, um, what if they're not just foolish and forgetful? What if there's something about their lack of preparation that makes them dangerous to others and, and harmful to the kind of people Jesus blesses back in the Beatitudes? Well, that's what I was going to say. I think, you know, part, I mean, I hear an allusion back to the Beatitudes or the, actually after the Beatitudes or you are the light of the world. Uh, and so with the, with the light imagery here of lamps, um, that's, that's, that's part of what the resonance that I hear as well, that yes, it is about preparedness, but it's, uh, it's also, um, it's also maybe recognizing and and really truly living your identity uh and so if you if 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 you are aware of that identity you are the salt of the you know the salt of the earth and the light of the world uh there is something about the fact that then that that then that preparedness will happen um i'm not to try to weasel out of the difficulty of that matt but i i'm i am saying though that i think there's a certain sense where uh that's again why we always have to go back to the Beatitudes and why we have to go back to the Sermon on the Mount that this is who Jesus claims you know if you are since you are the salt or salt of the earth and light of the world this is what this looks like or this is what this means for you you will be prepared um, but you also need this reminder here as well <laughs> and if you hear what both of you are saying there uh, if if we've done everything we're supposed to do. We've crossed all the T's, we've dotted all the I's, except for, we didn't realize that the time was going to be long. And we're constantly in this how long. And the reality is, is if we were, if we truly recognize the moment that we're in, then we would have prepared ourselves for us not just saying, 
Um, I crossed my T's, I dotted my I's, I said yes to Jesus, I joined the church, um, I got baptized, I'm in. But no, being in means that you have the task, being the light of the world. And that means that you have to be prepared to do that until the bridegroom returns. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, and, and that's, that's our task. That's our responsibility. It's not just what we get in this. It's being able to, um, uh, I like to say we get saved to be the salvation for somebody else. I think that's important that you, you've talked about the you talked about time as the factor in this parable because the next parable the talents next week will be about less about time and more about your actions your responsibility your willingness to be engaged in the work there's not a sense in that parable of a, of a delayed time and, and then when we get to sheep and the goats it's going to be well, it's a different audience there but it's also this idea of is Christ recognizable in the world and uh, people who don't necessarily have any reason to serve Christ might nevertheless be doing so. So that, I do think the preacher needs to make a, a, make it pretty clear to folks. If you're going to jump into Matthew 25 ways in which these parables are different and ways in which we're getting different facets of, of why Jesus is so concerned. Yes. Yes. So, uh, you know, I'm, We've gone on about this, but it's such a compelling parable. I, you know, I can't imagine not addressing it in some way. Um, what do we know about weddings in the first century? Does it does does that offer any? You know, as a as an exegete, of course, I'm grasping for any kind of help I can get. Right? Uh, I don't think it helps in the end. Uh, I remember one of our now retired colleagues. Um, on a series of videos we did say, oh, this parable always bothered him until, and then he, and then he offered something. And I don't remember what he said, because there's no help to me. <laughs> if, you we, know. if we think, we, if we stick with the time element, um, the way that the bridegroom arrives or when that return of the bridegroom, it's never known. Um, and I know this from the text where, you know, Jesus is saying, um, um, you know, he doesn't know when the hour is. Nobody knows but the Father. And and if we parallel this along there, and, and Matthew, you can, Matt, you can tell me if this is what Matthew is doing, but um, that's the whole point of the time, is that we don't know, and so we have to have enough oil in the lamp in case it's a long wait, because no one knows when the bridegroom is coming but the Father. Is, is that conflating the wrong um, background there? No, I don't think so. I, I mean, no, I don't think you're, you're correct. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Shoo! <laughs> it, it raises the question of what is Matthew worried about here? Is this a delay of the parousia, a delay of Jesus' return? And Matthew's worried about attrition in the church, people dropping out. I, I think it, probably is partly that, but something bigger in the sense of the way in which Matthew is writing to a community that appears to be in conflict with other Jewish groups, with perhaps itself over who has, who's a real teacher and who has authority to name where God is involved and engaged and probably has been burned or abused perhaps by, by some groups. All that, I mean, it's just because there's so many stories that are, that are like that, but the, I don't know, the wedding, the wedding motif, I don't know what to make of that. I, what do we, I mean, this is to Rolf's question. They, they, they seem to be a, a extended affairs. They were, weren't just, you know, see you Saturday at 11. Uh, <clears throat> we don't have any record about DJs, but I'd assume you need a good DJ at your wedding. You've got to play Rock Lobster and Love Shack at some point. Um, what about wedding favors? I, Jordan Rock Lobster, because Jesus had declared all foods clean. Jordan we Almonds. Don't. Jordan, get it? Jordan Almonds? Anyway. There you go. The, you know, there's the, obviously the, the bridegroom is going to have, there's a sense of, of higher status than, and remember the, the Greek verb, the Greek word is just parthenos. They're literally virgins, but 
Yeah. Um, or young women. Yeah. <clears throat> we call them uh, 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 bridesmaids to avoid having to explain some stuff, but but they, their role appears to be not just friends of the bride, but they appear to have some kind of service role on behalf of the, which would suggest again, a, probably a larger wedding. This is probably a higher class kind of wedding envisioned here. I don't know if that rescues the parable, but it might help explain some of the weirdness. Like why would the bridegroom be such a jerk to the bridesmaids? It's it's very different from a yeah, modern Yeah, he's the one who's late regard. after all. You know what I mean? <laughs> He had things to it's do. It's his problem. He's late. He had things to do. It's very... No, he was delayed. It doesn't say he was late. Yeah. It's a lot of work planning a wedding for most men. It so is. That... one last thing. <laughs> okay, that was about a joke it. if you're just doing audio only. All right. The last thing about the parable, though, is I'm, um, I'm, uh, my imagination is caught by the uh, trim, trim the lamp, which a lot of people won't know what that is today. And so, you know, this is a chance for the children's sermon. You know, uh, a lot of you are probably on video, so you can, you know, uh, I was looking behind me in my house to see if I had one of uh, our oil lamps, but it means to uh, to cut off the excess, but so the lower the wick, right? The, the smaller the flame, therefore it burns longer. And it, it's, that just seems to me something mature and wise about the Christian life. Uh, similar to the parable of the soils where the, the one who, you know, just is on fire at first, a flame, you know, with passion. Um, I went back, I can't remember if it was my 25th or 30th high school reunion, something like that, because I'm old. Um, in high school, one of my friends had been uh, a very passionate Christian. Uh, he'd had a conversion experience in high school, and one of my friends had nothing to do with the church. For 30 years, I thought that's who they were. And then uh, at one of the reunions, uh, the guy who'd been passionate on fire for the Lord conversion experience, he was like, yeah, Rolf, you're a pastor, unless you can give me proof, I don't believe. And the other guy that I thought uh, had no interest in the church, uh, active in two different churches in, in our hometown. And so um, it, does, it just tells me that something, there's that metaphor of keep the wick trimmed is, is about the slow and steady sort of faith for the long haul of life uh and it's maybe communally you know what kind of congregations and churches last the the test of time for generations i don't know all right we're next with that we have to do amos <laughs> if that wasn't hard enough oh amos is i love it i love this text because I assume it's not about me, of course. The, uh, yeah, the great thing is uh, you got a wedding text and then you, I hate, I despise your festivals, I <laughs> right? I always think about this uh, uh, whenever there's like a lot of fancy things going on in church, uh, you know, prant chancel prancing, we used to call it uh, pejoratively. And then I always I sit there and think, I hate, I despise your festivals. Um, the day of the Lord uh, starts off uh, is this not the day of the Lord? Alas, for those who desire the day of the Lord. At first, it's a reference probably to Leviticus 25, the, uh, you know, the um, year of Jubilee, that's called the day of the Lord, uh, which eventually then the t probably got the day of the Lord became, you know, so it's something you look forward to. Then it became probably, oh, the day of the Lord, that's going to be when God shows up for Israel and, uh, and we quit getting oppressed by our enemies. And then Amos comes along and says, yeah, it's not going to be such a good thing when that happens, when God comes to set things right and redistributes uh, all the wealth. Yeah, you're going to be, um, it's not going to be good for you. It's going to be like, and I love this, uh, uh, you know, it's going to be like you flee from a lion and run into a bear. You escape, you finally get back into your house, you close the door because you got away from the bear and you lean against the wall. Oh yeah, you leaned right into a poison a snake. snake. <laughs> right. So anyway, it's um. Did people keep snakes in their house in ancient Israel, Rolf? Is that? Uh, they did not. Okay. And that's kind of the point. Okay. But the snakes would get in there. You know what I mean? <laughs> but of course, so take away from me the noise of your songs. What does God want? Justice and righteousness. And then 
People like to quote that, assuming they already know what justice and righteousness are. You don't. To, to know what justice and righteousness are, you have to read the law and the prophets. Mm -hmm. Don't assume that your cultural uh, understanding of justice um, is already what God wants, because you, um, you have to study to figure that out. Says Amos or says Rolf? Says Rolf, because people just like to proof text this. It's Matt. Yeah. Uh, Matt, on a different context, uh, I was teaching the book of Micah, and Matt goes, oh, what are you doing? I'm preparing for class tonight. What are you teaching Micah? And Matt said? That's a great verse. <laughs> yes. You've heard the story before, but, uh, and of course, that is, we like Amos to quote, is true. do Amos. justice, love kindness. Or people like to quote this one. Um, the uh, Let justice roll down like waters. Yeah. People like yeah. to quote it. And then out of context, they like to quote it. Right. Sure. But then they don't actually want to um, know what that is. Yeah. Well, they Amos. assume they already know. So, uh, uh -huh. Well, then maybe this is a great pairing for the Matthew 25 text, which you it know, is. maybe parables, maybe the job of a parable is not to give you all the answers and to figure it out. Maybe the job of a parable is to call you into some kind of active reflection within a community. And so if that's the case, then how do we avoid being like these bridesmaids? Maybe Amos says, yeah, you should be afraid. Uh, but here's, here's a tip. <laughs> Pursue justice and righteousness. Uh, do the work that, that, that Rolf is talking about to figure out what that is and then do it. Do it locally. So let me get in trouble in the midst of uh, coming off of, um, of having all these months where we couldn't practice the rituals of the way that we worship um, our songs and festivals and celebrations. Um, and in the midst of not being able to gather um, where we have been in community, um, on Facebook, on Twitter, you know, and, and that kind of social media, um, we definitely haven't been just, we haven't built, built community, we haven't uh, invited people in. Um, so, I mean, I love this because it makes me say, ouch. Because while we're saying, I want to sing my songs, I want to gather for a communion, it's like, you know, maybe gathering right now isn't going to make God happy because God is reading our Twitter feed, because God is watching what, what we're posting on Facebook. And if we bring it to that kind of contemporary, Amos is a very scary passage and still a very living truth. And worse, God is reading the, the Twitter stream in your heart. The Amen. one that you actually don't even put out there. Amen. Amen. True. I'd so like speaking... to console myself. Oh, that's that's great. I'm not on Twitter. Yeah, you are. Yeah. You got one inside. That's right. That's right. So speaking of great verses, Joshua, that's a great verse, too. <laughs> both <laughs> both of them are great verses. They are. I like this passage too from Joshua. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, I, I was, ho um, I was hoping to hear from you on this. This is the other one. I, like, I do. I like this passage a lot. Go ahead, and I'll explain a, why. No, I want to hear. Verse, you go no. for it. Because, yeah, here, you know, um, we've come full circle on the calling of Abraham. Uh, here we go. We're in the land. Land's been, land's been taken. And Joshua gives this speech. And we like to think back at Abraham as the first monotheist, right? And Joshua gives this speech where it's clear these are all polytheists in the crowd. He's like, I know you all got these gods hidden away in your saddlebags and in your backpacks and stuff like that. Stop it. Like, put them away, right? Just worship the Lord and the Lord only. So it's, it's this lovely um, reminder that it wasn't like Abraham made his choice and then the whole nation fell into line. That this is an ongoing struggle. And of course, keep reading throughout Samuel and Kings, and this is the continuing problem. Would you stop worshiping all these other gods and just turn to the Lord and the Lord alone? So it's this, it gives us, I think, a glimpse into what must have been the historical reality of these monotheists trying to, I almost said tame a nation, but you know, trying to condition a nation or convince a nation 
to follow God and God alone. So there were no, maybe there were no uh, good old days back when, back when faith was easy or leadership was easy. Trying to form a peculiar people because the culture around them was, was comfortable with many gods, but they were being called out to be a peculiar people. And wow, those two lines, uh, Matt, that this is, that leadership has always been hard and the people of God have always been living in the tension of what God requires and what the culture around us allows. Well, plus it got, you know, he got, he got one of what he said on a plaque, which I think is pretty. Yes. <laughs> I, that, that's, uh, that's something I'm, I'm hoping for some days. Somebody puts, you know, me on a plaque somewhere. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, but I think, you know, we've talked about this before, but uh, putting that, uh, that's the one verse that people know from Joshua. Uh, and, and, but to put that in the context of what you were um, saying, Matt, in terms of, uh, all these other, all these other gods, right? It's not just, it's not, you know, Joshua thinks in that moment, what, yeah, what would look good on a plaque, but it's in this context of, as you said, Joy, what does it mean to be this peculiar people? Uh, I, yeah, and it, and especially, um, you know, not, not to allegorize this too much, but when we think about uh, when we think about what um, the the ways in which uh, other deities, if you will, uh, compete for our worship, um, and and what does it mean here and now uh, to say, uh, for me and my house we will serve the Lord, um, and is that really is that really true? Is that really who you are? And what you do or not. Can people tell that um, by looking at your house? <laughs> um, and not that you just have it on a plaque, um, but can people really tell that in the way you go about your, about your living? So yeah, I think it'd be, I think it'd be good. This is a case uh, where the new translation wrecks the poetry. Uh, we just have to stop and say, which is, you know, as for me and my house, that, instead of household, yeah. That doesn't go on a plaque as for me and my household. It's uh -huh. gotta be house. It has to be house. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which I've does never mean, seen it with household. Right. It's, I wouldn't uh, buy that plaque if it said that. No, in any language. <laughs> uh, my right. friend, uh, my dear friend, Hans Weersma, who comes, uh, who's Dutch uh, ancestry. This is a big verse in that tradition in Dutch reformed Calvinism. Mm -hmm. They love this. It's, I think because it's, it's a covenant text and that they are covenant theologians like Matt and uh, right, Matt. Uh, is this oh, is my, that's as for me what and my is house. That? What is that false God you're worshiping there? <laughs> yeah. That's my house includes a cat. If you're watching um, on, you're not watching on video. You just miss Rolf's cat. It's uh, who's uh, my name. Um, it's, but so, he, you know, he does, my friend Hans has that plaque. Uh, in both probably English and Dutch in his house. Um, it, it speaks to the parents' role in leading a family. I think that's an important thing. It, it, the whole text speaks of the importance of renewing the covenant in every generation, that, that um, every generation needs to then come along and be joined to the covenant. But actually the verse I like is uh, verse 19. So Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Who are you going to serve? Jews, the people go, We're, we'll serve the Lord too. You can't. You cannot serve the Lord. And if you read, as Matt said, the rest of the Bible, it's true. And so this is a nice verse to set next to the virgins is we can't do it. You know, um, God wants one thing, that we do justice, love kindness, follow the Lord, love the Lord our God with all our heart and our neighbor as ourselves, and we can't do it. So then what? We God say does it for us. Be pleased, Lord, to deliver me. Yeah. Yes. Be pleased, oh God, to deliver me. That's what we say. Yeah. Psalm one so, which is another short psalm. Yes. All right. Do you want some great trivia about Psalm 70? Yeah. So um, Psalm 70 is part of uh, what we Psalms nerds call the Eloistic Psalter. 
it's a, uh, it goes from like Psalm, I, I can't exactly remember, it's like 44 through 83 or something like that. And, and parts of other Psalms from other parts of the Psalter are included in it. And it's major feature is that it seems to prefer the name Elohim, therefore Eloistic, to Yahweh. Uh, the translate is Lord. And in a bunch of places, that text that occur elsewhere, such as Psalm 14 is re, uh, repeated in Psalm 53, except for Lord is changed to Elohim. And this little bit of Psalm 70 occurs in Psalm 40. And here's the great trivia. At the end is the one place in the Eloistic Psalter where a text that's Elohim somewhere else is changed to Yahweh. Okay. So where it says, you are my help, O Lord, do not delay, that's Elohim in Psalm 40. So it's the one place in the Eloistic Psalter where it prefers Yahweh. Huh. Okay. That's that helps wrong. nobody, but it's just darn interesting. Fascinating. <laughs> Trivia. Or, Yeah. Enlightening me. <laughs> Anything anyway. about 70 before we, uh, we should go? <laughs> also, we have this great passage from First Thessalonians. Well, again, it's, you know, it's, it's a great liturgical response to mm -hmm. the, the condemnations of Amos 5 and yeah. the judgment in uh, Matthew 25. And so it is, um, you know, will God deliver me? You know, yep. I am poor and needy. Let's end with a stirring, uh, our best uh, minute and a half on, so on First Thessalonians 4. Well, another text that orients us toward the future and is a source of a whole lot of really bad eschatology. But at, at the end, Paul says, not that Paul's eschatology is bad, but interpretations of it are bad. Mm -hmm. But at the end, Paul says, encourage one another with these words, that this is that for Paul, speculation about the future is meant to be encouraging. Uh, Paul doesn't say don't grieve the deaths of those among you, but uh, make sure you grieve with hope and make sure you know that the dead are at no disadvantage when it comes to encountering Christ. So that there's, there's a deep confidence in looking forward to whatever is next because Paul knows who Christ is and what God has promised.